Good morning, Grace Point. Is everybody ready to worship the Lord this morning? All right, go ahead and stand with us. And we're going to sing about heaven. Procedure on Wednesday. We want to remember them in prayer. 
Uh, we also want to remember Brother David Lloyd. He's suffering today. He's got in a lot of pain. And I know that there are many of you today that are also sick in body or you, you're worried about family members or you're worried about different situations. And I want to tell you, I believe with all my heart we serve a God that not only cares about what you care about. to the Lighthouse Ministry. You can see her. It's a great ministry. They, they uh, really take care of men, men that are struggling, men that, that have a need in the community and uh, help put them back on, on their feet and uh, preach and teach the gospel to them. So it's a great organization. So please see her. Also, September 19th. That's coming up this week, right? Saturday. Saturday starting at 8 a.m. Everybody say 8 a.m. We're having a work day here at the church. Now, it's small projects, nothing huge. Projects that men and women both can do. So if you can come spend a few hours here at the church helping us maintain the, the property, we would greatly appreciate it. You know, it, people don't always realize what it takes to keep a church running. Uh, but if you think about it like it's a, it's a huge house and all the maintenance you do on your own personal house, all of that maintenance has to be done here as well. Things have to be painted from time to time and cleaned and, and tightened and, and rearranged and all that good stuff. So if you'll come be here at 8 o'clock on September 19th, this Saturday, uh, we promise you we'll have some things for you to do and we won't keep you all day. All right? And then last but not least, starting next Sunday, so that'll be the 20th, September 20th, we're going to begin adult Sunday school. So, I, yeah, go ahead, clap. It'll be in the annex and start at 930. I will encourage you to come and, and listen. Brother Todd's going to do a great job teaching the class. He always does. I will ask you to follow the same kind of guidelines that we're following here in the sanctuary. Wear your mask while you're walking around the building. But once you get into the annex and get set down, you feel free to take it off. That way you can participate in the discussion. Um, but I believe that, that this is important. The socialization of it is important. I also believe the Bible study aspect of it is extremely important. We need to be biblically literate. Thank you. We need to know what the Bible says. Right? 
So come, enjoy those classes with Brother Todd, and, and you will be blessed. We're going to do a couple more weeks online for our Wednesday night Bible study, and then the first, sun, uh, first Wednesday in October, we'll come back in for um, Wednesday night uh Wednesday night classes here at the church for kids and uh, youth and adults. So we've got a lot going on. If our ushers will get ready to receive our tithe and offer, we're going to move right on to this part of our worship service. And then we're going to sing a few more songs. And then we're going to get to the, the message today. Amen. All right. Has the Lord been good to you this week? It's a little bit good to you throughout this whole pandemic. You know, I look at the numbers uh, two or three times a week to see what, what we're declaring, how many new cases we have in Blair County, how many folks are currently sick, what the, the, the death rate is here in our county. I, I believe this completely. God has blessed Blair County. Our numbers are significantly lower than other counties of our size. And I believe that that is because of God's graciousness. God has been good to us. And this time of worship, this time of offering, this time of giving back, is an opportunity for us to say to God, thank you. Thank you for the blessings in my life. Thank you for the job that I have. Thank you for the, the life that you have given me. And I want to give back to you. So if you will take your tithe and your offering into your hand and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We worship you. We honor you. We praise your holy name. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the, the blessings that you have poured out into our lives today. Lord, I thank you for how you have blessed my family, Lord, and how you have, you have made sure that we have all that we need, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you will receive our tithe and our offering and it will be a blessing to you, Lord. It will be a, a gift back to you. Lord, we love you, we honor you, we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Let's all stand together and worship with our praise team. start singing the first time I thought they were they were playing an instrumental version of he set me free yep. <laughs> so if I, yes. if I had started singing we have free once you saw the light that's there you go all right let's sing about Jesus now how about that the one who's
in the congregation with us today. Stand up, Melissa, and show grace and off to everybody. Over the next several weeks, we're going to have some baby dedications, and I'm looking forward to that. We're going to get to dedicate Grayson and then uh, Olivia and, and uh, Addison. So we're just going to have a great time. Amen? I love baby dedications. If I can avoid getting thrown up, it's a great day. But if I get thrown up on, that's funny too. So it's all good. This morning, I want to talk to you about...
keys. Keys. I, I was thinking as I was preparing this sermon, uh, when was the first time I got a key to something? And um, I was six years old, and we were living in Cleveland, Tennessee. Uh, Mom was working at the World Business Department. Dad was at the publishing house and a full-time student at Lee. And I was in first grade, and uh, I would walk about a half a mile from my elementary school to number 10 Carroll Court. Can you believe I remember my address from when I was six years old? And, uh, and I had that key, and I'd unlock the door, and I'd go in, and uh, uh, Mom would have me a list of things to do. Can you believe that? Six years old. And I usually got most of them done. But that, having that key, that key was, made me feel like a grown-up, you know? I got a key. And, and then as you get older, you, you get keys to other things. I, I remember... Uh, June 17th, 1985, at the big age of 16, I got keys to my first car. There you go. Come on, somebody. A candy apple red. That was the only cool thing about the car. It was red. 1985 Plymouth Horizon. Zero to 60 in four days. That thing was built like a tank. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But you get that key, and, and, and there's just something really cool about that. Now, uh, understand, I got the key, and then my dad also handed me this little envelope that contained the payment book. And back then, I think we made a big $2.15 an hour. You had to flip a lot of hamburgers at McDonald's even to make a $67 car payment. But it was a, it was a big deal. Was, I'm 16, I got my own car. Do you, do you remember the feeling that you got the first time you got a set of car keys? Maybe it was a set of, a, a sense of freedom. Man, I don't have to rely on anybody to take me somewhere. I, I can go. Or, or maybe it was a, a sense of responsibility. Oh, how cool is this? And, and, and maybe you felt mature, you felt grown up for the first time. Maybe, maybe you felt like this was really great. I remember thinking, oh, this is terrible to admit in public. I remember thinking, finally, I'm going to get a date. Some girl will take pity on me because I got a car to go out with me. I'll tell you a real quick funny story about that car. Um... I had just started driving it to school, and um, one day, the, the rule was that any time mom needed my car, she could come get it. And, you know, I was just out of luck, because moms trump sons. So anyway, so I, I find this, this friend of mine, and, and she, she's a cute little girl, her name was Julie, and uh, I convinced her to let me take her home after school one day. And I go bouncing out of class at the end of our school day and uh, go into the student parking lot and my car is missing. It's gone. And I'm standing there thinking, oh Lord, of all these cars in the parking lot, somebody broke in and stole that. And then the bus is parted. And this 1977 uh, Country Squire station wagon was visible. That was the church's car. The church had a daycare. And my dad was sitting in that Country Squire station wagon playing some southern gospel music at the top of his, you know, the speakers and hollering, Jim! And I thought, oh, Lord, my dating life is over. So I apologized to Julie. We took her home and she never talked to me again. <laughs> anyway, but getting those keys, keys are important. And, and here's the thing about them. I had the car and I had the keys, but if I had refused to use those keys, if I had never gotten into the driver's seat and stuck that key into the ignition and, and turned that key and, and, and 
and started the engine and, and put it in the drive and, and, and drove that car, those keys would be useless. They would do me no good. There's just one more thing to keep up with. Having keys means ownership, it means power, it means, it means having the ability to unlock something or, or have access to something that nobody else has access to exactly the way that you do. It's like you're part of something exclusive. Now, keys get mentioned a lot in the Bible, and I'm going to mention that in a minute, but in Matthew, I want to focus on a couple of scriptures here that, where Jesus tells this story, or we have Jesus in this story, and he talks about some powerful keys that he's giving out this day. Stand with me. I'm going to read uh, two verses. Stand with me, if you will. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for your presence here today. And Lord, I pray that these next few moments that I will do justice to the word that you've given me today. In your holy, holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now I know you guys know this story well. You know what part uh, of, of the, the story that these verses come from. But I'm going to give you a little quick background. Jesus and his disciples, are, they're walking through this region of Caesarea Philippi. And they're walking and talking, and, and, and uh, I wish there were more of these kinds of stories in the Bible, to be honest with you. I would have loved to have listened to those conversations that Jesus had with his disciples while they're, they're walking. But in this particular conversation, Jesus says to them, what are people saying about me? What's the word on the street? Who do people think I am? And you know, the guys jump up real quick to say, oh, some folks say you're Jeremiah. Or maybe one of the other prophets. Oh, well, I, I've heard you called Elijah. Some folks say you're, you're, you're John the Baptist. That's interesting. And these, then Jesus, he kind of turns on them. And he says, who do you say that I am? That is one of the most important questions that we need to answer as Christians. Because, let me be here with you today it doesn't matter who I say Jesus is for you it matters for me but Jesus wants to know who you think he is what do you say he is how, how do you describe him What's your relationship like with him? And so these guys, these 12 guys that, that, that are walking with him literally every single day, they're, they're traveling miles and miles and miles together every single day. They're, 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 they're performing miracles. They're seeing miracles happen. They're hearing him de de declare the, the kingdom of heaven to them literally every single day. What their opinion of him is, is important. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, being Peter, quickly jumps out and answers the question. Now most of the time, when Peter opens his mouth, it's to swallow his foot. Okay? But on this one, he got it right. He says, thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ. Nowhere up to this point has Jesus been called that. 
Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, Jesus, knowing Peter really well, he says, listen, <laughs> it took the Holy Spirit to, to reveal that to you because you're kind of thick-headed. That's Jim Spivey translation right there. Let me tell you, it's okay. We're all a little thick-headed. He said, he said that had to be revealed to you by the Spirit. You just don't stumble onto that understanding and, and this, con this, this confession, this realization that he is the Christ, that he is the son of the living God, that he is the, the holy lamb sacrificed for our sins. It is that confession and that realization upon which Christ built the church. Some people get that verse mixed up and they say, oh, well, Christ built the church upon Peter. Our church isn't built on a man. Things built by men are fallible. Things built uh, upon a man come crashing down. But Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, he is that perfect foundation. And, and, and it is our understanding of who he is that allows him to build his church. And then he says to this, because you understand that, I got something for you. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to give you access to something that, that, that's going to blow your mind. I'm going to give you keys to the kingdom. Now, I've been given a lot of keys in my life. I, I typically don't carry keys up into the pulpit because I don't like them weighing down my pocket. But I got my house keys and my car keys and, and I got my church keys. This is only about a third of the keys to the church. I feel like it's a Philippian jailer starter set. None of these keys are as important as the keys that Christ I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom, the keys to open up anything in heaven and loose it here on earth. Or the keys to bind up anything here on earth and, and bind it up in heaven. That's powerful. And what's so amazing is that every single believer gets a set of those keys. What? What? Yeah. When you say, Jesus, come into my life, come into my heart, make me a new creature, forgive me of my sins. When, when, you, when, when, you, when you make that confession, you are literally spiritually given access to the keys to the kingdom. These keys, they, they come with, with great value and they're, they're part of a sacred trust. I told you about that car. I've told this story before. We lived in a weird little rancher house and the uh, garage was on the front of the house but you, you came into the driveway that had to make a hard turn into the garage instead of just being able to drive straight in. And I always parked my car on the outer spot. Well, for whatever reason that day, somebody had parked our minivan in my spot, and I come in the driveway, I was probably doing about 45 or 50, but I had figured out how to sling that little car around and line it up and park it, and it was good. Well, I come slinging around and uh, see the van there and think, well, I don't need to run into mom and dad's car, so I'm gonna pretend like it's the Dukes of Hazard and do one of these snappy moves and whip it around and go into that other spot. Well, I went this way, right into mom and dad's bedroom, right through the garage door, or right through the garage wall. You know, that's a tough conversation to have with the pastor's council. Uh, my son parked uh, the car in the bedroom. What? I learned a very valuable lesson that day. 
keys given can also be keys taken away. So about six months later, when I got my keys back, I vowed never to lose them again. Sometimes we treat the keys that God's given us carelessly. We got these keys, we throw them around, we don't, we, we can't even locate them. Do you know where the keys of the kingdom are that God's given you? Do you know how to access them? Do you, do you know what they're used for? you know how to use them? told you that keys are a frequent topic in the Bible. I'm going to give you two examples. One uh, is with Joseph. We know about Joseph. He was the ruler over Egypt. The whole world was without food. And then Joseph had the opportunity to open the storehouses to feed the people. Joseph had the keys to the granary. He had, the, he had access to the food. His power to open uh, the granaries and to shut them was great because millions of people came. They would either starve or live based on his word. Those keys had power. I think about Elijah, and it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, but Elijah had keys to rain. That's a powerful key. He had the power to shut up the heavens. And we read in 1 Kings 17, verse 1, As the Lord of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except by my word. And sure enough, three and a half years later, three and a half years went by, and finally the nation repented. And then Elijah prayed. And it rained again. So I want you to think about the keys this way. In the very beginning, in Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth and created everything on the earth. And he created man and he gave us the keys then. But Adam and Eve sinned. And they relinquished those keys to Satan. We forfeited our access to those keys. We forfeited the keys because of sin to Satan. Then Jesus comes along and, and he buys back those keys with his life. He bought them back with the blood spilled on that cross. He, he buys them back and then he turns right around and gives those keys right back to us. I'm really hammering this point because I want you to understand that these keys to the kingdom that we have are the most costly keys ever purchased and given to anybody. Just because they are freely given to you does not mean that they did not come at a high price. They came at the highest price. And just because they are freely given to you does not mean that they are given without responsibility and accountability. We each have these keys if you've called on Jesus Christ. Now the great thing about these keys, the thing that, that, that just really excites me about these keys is they are backed by absolute authority. Think about that. When, when you're given a, a, a key to a city, that's a ceremonial key, right? You really can't unlock every lock in the town. There are some big padlocks at the end of the town that, that the key to the city unlocks, you know. They're ceremonial. These keys come with real authority, real power. So, so what kind of power? Mark 1, says this, And they were astonished at his teaching, this is Jesus, for he taught them as one having authority and not as one of the scribes. He has authority, he taught with authority, and then he turned around and gave that authority to us. So what is that authority? Let me tell you, it's the authority to command the wind and the waves. 
It's the authority to heal the cripple. It's the authority to open blind eyes. It's the authority to stop a funeral procession in its tracks. It's the authority to engage the full resources of heaven and call down rain. It's the authority to bind up those things that need to be bound up and to loosen those things that need to be loosened. This is the authority that comes with these keys. We have this authority because Jesus Christ, the authority, gave that authority to us. He shared it with us. But so many times, so many of us, so many Christians choose to live a victim existence. Satan has come in and there's been a battle and he's fought us and and he's stolen things from us. And we stand there and say, woe is me. Instead of engaging in the fight. You see, Satan comes in and he, he steals our hopes and he steals our dreams. He steals our joy. He steals our treasures. And not only does he steal them, but then he claims them as his own. And then he'll taunt you. He'll taunt you. He'll say, you're powerless. You're weak. You're unimportant. You're nobody. And I got your stuff. You don't have the authority or the ability to come back and get them. That's what Satan says. The crazy thing is we'll listen to him. But we won't listen to Jesus when Jesus says, listen, I've given you the keys. All power and authority I have given to you. Satan is a liar. Jesus says, you're a joint heir with me in God's kingdom. This this power, this authority, these keys that Christ has given to us is our key to try uh, to, to, to triumph over adversity. It's our, it's our key to victory. Now I believe that one of the reasons we struggle so much in this is because we really don't know who Satan is. We, we, we tend to see Jesus and Satan or God and Satan as equals on the battlefield. They're not equals. It's like a a junior high baseball team playing the New York Yankees. It's not even close. We don't understand who Satan is. So I'm going to help you with that this morning. I'm going to translate some verses for you in Jim Spivey vernacular. Satan is a whiny crybaby. Come on. Somebody say whiny crybaby. He's a tattletale. He, he goes around tattling on the brothers and sisters. Now you say, Pastor, come on. That's not in the Bible. Yeah, actually it is. That's what Jesus called him, a whiny crybaby tattletale. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, which is right in front of the verse I love so much, verse 11. But it says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser, whiny crybaby tattletale. Well, you see the word accuser, Say, whiny, crybaby, tattletale. For the accuser of our brethren who has accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. The whiny, crybaby, tattletale accuser of our brethren. Now, listen. I may dress up kind of decent, but there's a whole lot of South Georgia redneck in this boy. Okay? So I'm going to explain this for you. I can talk about my family, but if somebody else talks about my family, that's fighting words. Even if what they're saying is true, 
They're not allowed to say it. I'm not even sure they're allowed to think it. And they had better not whisper it around me. That's what Jesus is saying. Satan's nothing but a whiny crybaby tattletale making accusations against his brothers and sisters and he's saying, I'm kicking him out. At the end of the day, I'm going to bind him and kick him into the, 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 the lake of fire. Whiny crybaby. Is that how it is up here? You can talk about your family, but if somebody else does, oh boy. So let me say it to you this way. When the enemy attacks, and the enemy's going to attack. Why don't, instead of us whining and crying about it, we quote Luke, or I'm sorry, we quote Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, saith the Lord. I love this verse. Let me tell you, this is what I do when I, when I read this verse, when I, when I pray this verse. I say no weapon formed against Jim is going to prosper. Every tongue which rises up against Jim in judgment, Jesus himself is going to cast it down. This is the heritage of me, the servant of the Lord. And my righteousness is from him, Jesus Christ. This verse is for you today too. Now maybe you're in the middle of a battle right now and you're saying, Pastor, I'm fighting the fight right this minute. What do I do? I feel beat up. I feel pushed around. How about this? We quote Luke chapter 10 verse 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and all over the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall hurt you. Well, I've been hurt by the enemy. It's because you were looking at the wrong place for your source of power. Jesus said, when you plug into me, when you, when you plug into me, you got power. The enemy can't even come close to you. He can't hurt you. He can't beat you. He can't defeat you. But you got to plug into the right source of power. So listen, I'm going oh my Lord, somewhere along the lines, in the last 30, 40 years uh, of the church's existence, we have been told that we needed to sit down and be quiet and be passive and just get along to go along. Can I tell you, that's not how the Bible reads. The Bible says that this authority that we have, or, or the way I understand this authority that we have, it requires aggressive action on our part. It requires us to have a Holy Ghost-fed passion. It, so it's time that we stopped running away and, and hiding, and, and we started storming the very gates of hell. It's time we quit shrinking back. The Bible says we're not of those that shrink back. It's time that we went on the attack. Satan is a whiny crybaby tattletale. And let me put it to you this way. He is a small time gatekeeper. That's all he is. Small time gatekeeper. And because of Jesus, we have keys to those gates. He blusters and he yells and he fights and we shrink back. But we've got the keys. There's a great song we used to sing, well, take back what he stole from me. Remember that? Well, church, it's time that we quit, quit singing about it and actually do it. 
So how do we attack? How do we go back and get those things? We attack with our faith, not with fear. We attack with faith. It's through our faith in, in, in God, in who he is, and in the promises that he has made to each of us in his word that, that we can attack the gates of hell and be victorious. It's this faith that will allow us to look Satan in the eye and say, listen, you're just a, a whiny crybaby tattletale gatekeeper. And I'm here for my stuff. Get out of my way. It's time that we retrieved that which was lost. I think Paul does a great job explaining this battle in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 3. We need to understand this. We should fight. It says, for we walk in the flesh, but we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. It is through faith and through prayer that we can storm the gates of hell and shout with divine authority. That is my child. You can't have them anymore. This is my spouse. I'm not letting them go. There is my joy. I see it right there. I'm taking it back. You've had it long enough. There's my confidence. There's my hopes. There's my dreams. There's my treasures. They're not locked up in hell anymore. They are mine by divine right and authority. And I'm here to take back my stuff. Give me back my stuff in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to leave here in a few minutes. I'm going to pray a prayer and we're going to say amen and we're going to go get in our cars and head home, head to restaurants, head to wherever. And Satan's going to whisper to some of you, that sermon isn't for you. These words, they're not for you. These promises that pastors so willingly quoted aren't for you. He's going to say this, your keys don't work. Your keys are nothing. So I'm going to remind you for a moment what the word says you are. The Bible clearly says that you are created in his image. You are his workmanship. Created for good works. You are God's child. You are chosen, you are royal, you are holy, and you are called out of darkness. You are God's temple, and his Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. You've been given a spirit of power and love and self-control, not a spirit of fear. You are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ Jesus. God has plans for you, plans for your good, plans for your future. God has hope for you. And I love this one. God knows you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. For some of us, Brother Rick, that's not hard to count. But he knows your name. He knows your name. So now I want to remind you who Satan is, and you tell me if this battle is even. He's a whiny crybaby. He's a tattletale. He's a liar. He's a thief. And he's a lowly gatekeeper. You tell me who's going to win this fight if we engage with the power of Jesus Christ. Stand with me, if you will, please.
right where you are today, right, right there, I want you to, I want everybody to close your eyes. And in your own words, I want you to pray this prayer. Lord, I have neglected my keys. Lord, I, I have been unwilling, afraid, didn't know how to use them. But I'm standing here today, Lord, saying I'm sorry. Forgive me of my reluctance. And Lord, if you will give me the opportunity, I will put Satan on the run. I'm tired of losing. I'm tired of feeling like it's time to give up. I'm tired of, of my stuff being taken. I'm tired of our kids being lost. I'm tired of our brothers and sisters be, being in drug rehab facilities and, and, and struggling with life. Lord, it's time that we took them back in the name of Jesus Christ. We've lost too much because we were unwilling to fight. But Lord, we're standing here today as an army, an army of the Lord. Lord, lead us, direct us, guide us, order our steps, show us where to go, show us where to fight, show us what to do, Lord. And we were willingly, willingly lay down our lives for the glory of the kingdom. Lord, I'm going to take these keys that you've given me. I'm going to take this power, this authority, this responsibility that you've given me and I will no longer be one of those that shrink back. But we will storm the gates of hell. No power, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We're going to trample on scorpions. We're going to trample on serpents. We're going to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen, amen, amen. This is one of those services that I bring everybody down to the altar and we'd have one of those kind of moments. But I need you to do this. I need you to take this responsibility. I need you right where you are to pray through. When you're going home today, pray through. Pray through and touch the hem of the garment. Pray until you reach who through to Christ Jesus. Pray until you feel that moment of release where the Lord is touching your situation, touching you and encouraging you and pushing you into your rightful place. You are powerful today because you reside in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember our announcements for this next week. Sunday school starts this coming Sunday. We still do our Wednesday night classes on Zoom for the next couple weeks. Remember to see Gail in the lobby for um, your apple dumplings. And know that you are precious to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.